Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Market Checklist Week 107. And before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Apologies if I'm slightly croaky. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding the topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What do we have this week, Keith? Well, before we get going, I'd quite like to talk about our title photo this week. And this is Chinese infrastructure. And if you look at this photo, you can see, actually, out of the picture, there's another tunnel. But one, two, three tunnels with train lines, this viaduct with a train line and motorways underneath. And the point is, and this is from Michael Pettis this week, a China specialist, and he was talking about how over the past decades, local governments in China have invested vast amounts in infrastructure to keep GDP growing. But that infrastructure doesn't earn cash revenues. And so China has a lot of local government debt. How is it going to pay the interest on that debt? And last week, we showed you a chart of income tax levels in China, which are pretty much non-existent. China has been funding itself through land sales, and land sales are slowing. So watch this space. Okay, news this week. Well, it is one year since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which was meant to be over in a few days. It looks like a long war of attrition now, sadly. We had revised EU inflation numbers for January, and I'm afraid they were revised higher. Core CPI is now estimated to have risen in January up from 5.2% to 5.3%. So inflationary pressures everywhere seem to be more persistent than we had been assuming. The good news is the UK budget deficit so far in this financial year has come out 30 billion lower than feared. And that means we can afford to pay the nurses and settle all these um, public sector strikes, he says, fingers crossed. And piece of also good news is that Citigroup have actually lowered their UK inflation forecasts for this year and are now expecting inflation in the UK to be close to 2% by the year end. Some charts. Now, over the last couple of weeks, since we had positive economic surprises in the US, the market expectations for where interest rates are going to peak in the US have massive, risen massively. So the day before the payroll report, we were expecting interest rates to peak in the US at about 4.88% in June. Now, so the 17th, we're forecasting them to peak in August at 5.3%, almost a 50 basis point rise in expectations market is now expecting interest rates in the US to be higher for longer. And the probability of a 25 basis point rise at the June meeting is now over 60%. So market expecting US rates to be higher for longer and the rate at the end of this year to be above 5%. Those are big changes. As a result of that, Financial conditions, which had been loosening, have been tightening again. This is the Citigroup UK inflation forecast. The blue line is January. The red line is February. So they've actually lowered their forecasts. Let's hope they're right. The other thing that's happened is that both oil and gas prices are now cheaper than they were prior to the invasion of Ukraine, which is not what you would have expected. Russia has succeeded in exporting all its oil via secondary 
hidden means. India's taking a lot of it. And this is UK uh, finances for this financial year, which are 30 billion better than expected, thanks to higher tax receipts, lower central government spending, and lower spending by local governments. And on to this week's economic data. So actually, it was a light data week, so I'm going to go through it all. So we had UK retail sales, and they were much better than expected in January. The expectation was they would contract by 0.8%. They actually rose by 0.5% year on year, still contracting by 5.1%, but better than expected. UK public sector borrowing was much better than expected. There was a surplus of 6.2 billion above expectation of 2.2. Now, we've also had PMIs for Europe, the UK and the US, and they were all better than expected. Take a look. Beating expectations in manufacturing services and the composite. In all cases, manufacturing better than expected, but still contracting. Services has actually returned to growth, leading the composite to return to growth. UK consumer confidence also bounced, but remains deeply negative. So expected minus 42 came in at minus 38, which is still not a good number, but better than January. EU PMIs, very similar to the UK. Take a look. Contracting manufacturing, expanding services. The EU Economic Sentiments Index also massively beat expectations, but we'll show you the chart later. Again, it's not great. Now, construction in the EU actually contracted in January. It's expected at plus 2.1%. It was minus 1.3%. So higher interest rates are having the expected effect of discouraging capital investment and construction. And we've also had revised European inflation numbers. If you look at core CPI, that rose in January from December to 5.3% above expectations. CPI was also above expectations, but falling. Now, the only data we've got from the US this week is, again, the PMIs. And again, they show manufacturing having a bounce but still in contraction territory but services returning to growth in the case of the us mild growth richard some charts so we have uk consumer confidence which is uh moving upwards a little bit but still pretty low uk retail sales showing that improvement that keith referred to and uh, uk retail sales year on year actually really not particularly good at all UK public sector borrowing. This is an artifact, actually. So it looks like suddenly it's all got better, but basically the um, the uh, light brown bars shouldn't have been so big to the negative side. I think the OBR has been roundly criticised for getting it so wrong, haven't they? Whether how much of that criticism justified, I'm not sure. The CBI industrial trends orders, which is looking unhealthy. Yep, orders are he- unhealthy. The UK global manufacturing PMI is... Uh, just about neutral now and the uk services pmi is picking up from neutral so hmm. the uk economy not um doing as badly as some feared it might do and there, there we have the uk composite nicely nicely above 50. residential property transactions um, between january 20 and january 2023 in the uk the seasonal adjustment actually it's um looking at those graphs it's it's relatively small in the main isn't it yeah no i was very surprised by this so transactions are holding up remarkably well in the uk yeah yeah and the eu global manufacturing pmi can't really get up to 50. the services pmi though is looking up and that's a composite the eu construction output year on year is basically no growth but it hasn't really had any growth um, since mid-2021. And the EU consumer confidence picking up from that dreadful low, but I've got a long way to go before it gets back to neutral. And uh, this is a chart that puts it in perspective, which shows that the um, 
consumer confidence has recovered to the level of the great financial crisis. So it has a long way to go to get back to uh, the long term average, which noticeably is minus 10. So the EU consumer yes, is not very right. confident. <laughs> They're um, never very happy. No. And the uh, EU economic sentiment index is um, above zero. Yeah, it's actually decently positive. The reminder that this is a survey of economists. So economists are feeling you know, much more positive about the European economy. Um, EU CPI. Now, I think we need to be a little bit cautious about inflation figures because um, one or two uh, readings don't necessarily indicate a trend change so, um, or a reversal. But this is actually looking better than if it had been going in the other direction, certainly. Mm. Uh, but EU core CPI is not yet slow. Yeah. So what this is telling us is that energy and food, which we excluded from core P CPI, are coming down. But yeah. services P um, inflation is still rising. Uh, the US global manufacturing PMI has just picked up a little bit, but below 50. And the services PMI just around about 50. Composite PMI at 50. So this is a sort of real-time PMI estimate. Hey, you can see where it went to in the great financial crisis, and it basically has been bumping along, hasn't it, between 45 and 55. It had a big dip in COVID, a rise above that 55 line. And now it's sort of in its average regional, it's in the region of its average now. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting because this... Evercore is an investment bank, and their you know, PMI proxy has never had the falls of the S&P Global um, yeah. PMIs, and it's showing that the US economy is doing absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's had a bit of a slowdown since the sort of post-COVID recovery, but it, it's nothing to yeah. nothing too remarkable, is it? Absolutely. And actually, you know, the post-COVID everything seemed the best it's ever been. And now it is very good. Yeah. I mean, we have to uh, see what how long it takes for the effect of these interest rate hikes to come through the economy, don't we? Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, so US home sales month on month just dropped back a bit, slowed down, continued to slow down in January, but at a slower rate. More new homes are being built to rent which is the blue line, that are being built for sale, which is yeah. the red line, which suggests there's a sort of structural change going on at the moment, in the possibly in the US housing market. Well, I suggest the rents are, needed, are going to have to come down. So housing, buying houses is unaffordable. Rents are holding up. So, you know, yeah. for now, people are still building apartments for rent, but... The pace at which they're building apartments for rent is very high from, by historic standards. The pace at which they're bu building single family homes for sale is collapsing very quickly. Interesting to see whether this projected fall off in the number of completed houses uh, occurs that we talked about a few months ago. Hmm. Whether, well, we know that the, well, we know that there's a record number of houses currently under construction. So um, mortgage purchase application index seasonally adjusted, uh, fallen to their lowest reading ever. Yeah. Now, and this uh, leads home sales. Yeah. And um, there we are, the existing home sales, which is uh, dropped down to its, I think we have to ignore the COVID uh, spike down. It's got dropped down to its GFC level almost. Yeah. And, you know, the chart, month-on-month -month chart you were showing earlier, Richard, you know, month-on-month, -month, it's dropping. It's continuing to drop. And so this yeah. is going to go even lower, yeah. I expect. And the, the slowdown is happening at the same rate as it happened in about 2006, um, which obviously that led to the, um, ultimately, to the demise of Lehman's and the GFC and all those mortgage-backed securities, which hopefully... Um, there have been systematic changes that will stop that particular problem from occurring on this case. Yeah, no, I agree with that. 
and the US mortgage market index is basically bumping along at a very relatively very low level. Yeah, notice that that bounce in January where Full everyone back. got excited, you know, the mortgage market's yeah. coming back, the housing market's going back. Well, it didn't last. It won't come back, will it, Keith, I think, until the Fed stops increasing interest rates and starts to reduce them. Yeah. Because the affordability is, uh, is going down. They're getting houses are getting less affordable. Absolutely. Because, unless prices drop. Well, yes, but they've got to drop a long way. Yeah. So this is the um, Mortgage Bankers Association of America Purchase Index, um, which comes the entire market to get this proof. It's a reliable indicator, forward indicator of pending home sales. So it's at a very low level. It's at the lowest level it's been in eight years. And um, mm. yeah, I'm going to see whether that fairly steep drop uh, which is a bit noisy, whether it continues or not, but it's certainly heading in a significantly downwards direction, showing that it's going it, it, to, you know, the slowdown is not over and there's going to be some weak data coming through in the next few months, inevitably. Yeah. And if you just look at the absolute level, you're talking about mortgage yeah. applications, well, which were a third of what they were. Yeah. The US initial jobless claims, um, not very remarkable in any way. Yeah, the uh, jobs market in the US seems you know doing just fine. Thank you very much. Uh, it it does, doesn't it? And um, the US continuing jobless claims uh, again not very remarkable. So the all the work of the Fed hasn't yet impacted the um, the jobs market, which is called one of the one of the problems they've got is trying to slow the economy down. Yep. So global PMIs are looking better. Um, service sector PMIs particularly strong, um, but the manu and the manufacturing, whilst improving, they're still less than 50. Uh, consumer confidence improved, improved in February, but it's weak, particularly in Europe. U US housing sector continues to weaken. And as we've said many times, the US housing sector is a leading indicator of what of, of the US economy. So if the US housing sector continues to weaken, the likelihood of a recession in the US becomes greater and greater. And the global labor market remains tight. Um, but I don't think you can say just because the labor market's tight, there isn't going to be a recession. No, I completely agree. So as we've covered many times, employment, it can be the last thing to roll over. Okay, on to errors and corrections. And I'm afraid there is one. So last week, we talked about, actually Richard talked about, how the rise of intraday options could, was impacting VIX. And thank you to Mr. C. Peckham for correcting us. So, so VIX is calculated using options which have more than 23 days and less than 37 days to maturity. So the rise in intraday options will not directly impact VIX. And so this is this is Richard's point. If you look at this red bar here, the rise in intraday options is absolutely extraordinary. And then now, is that half? It's like pretty much half of all options. Yeah, forty percent. Yeah, from nothing, you know, ten years ago. It's absolutely... wild isn't it? But surely those options. Are going to have an in, have an impact on daily volatility, and that will then feed through to VIX. So I think there will be secondary effects, but not, not a direct but, measurement effect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And thank you once again to yeah. Mr. C. Peckham for getting in touch and pointing that out. Okay, on to one chart. Now this is a really important chart and one frankly, I should be aware of. So the dark blue line is the Fed funds rate. The light blue line is the market pricing of the Fed funds rate one year forward. And you'll see that the market tends to be systematically over-optimistic when the Fed's fund rate is rising. 
So if you think of a vertical line going through these two lines, when the fund, Fed funds rate is rising, the dark blue line is systematically below it. So that means the market is expecting the funds rate to be lower in a year forward. In the last two Fed rate rising cycles, the one year ahead forecast was too low until the Fed stopped hiking. Then it went too high. And then it expected the Fed fund rate to stay high for much longer than it actually was. And so this is a really important chart. And you know, when all this is over and I do a my worst trade on my latest dalliance with long term bonds, I will be using this because what it says is don't buy bonds until the peak of the rate, the rate cycle. Because the market underestimates how high interest rates are going to go, and then it overestimates them. And you want to be buying bonds when it's overestimating them. And on to Inflation Watch, Richard. Thank you, Keith. So only one new um, reading this week, which is uh, EU. So CPI for January is uh, 8.6% which is down, as Keith mentioned earlier, but core CPI at 5.3% is up. And um, they are operating the um, CPI to um, stabilise bond prices in the Southern European states. But um, they are doing um, some net QT in the EU. And... Uh, Japan, I mean, you're, when you're starting to read around the place that Japan may be um, a, a black swan in the making. Now, think about a black swan, you don't see it till it hits you. Um, so <laughs> I thought the terminology may not be right, but Japan's absolute determination to maintain its bond deals are so low. Well, we have got a new Bank of Japan governor starting shortly, haven't we? We may yeah. start to change policy, but I think his hands are pretty much tied. So... Um, yeah, some um, news on CPI or inflation, which suggests that uh, we're not necessarily fully out of the woods yet. So, Richard, on the Japan, what were they saying? What in what direction was the black swan going to be? Well, basically, the fact that the uh, if they raise interest rates, the um, proportion of government expenditure on servicing debt becomes unsustainable. And if they don't raise interest rates, inflation runs out of control. Yes. Um, so they are on the horns of a dilemma. Yeah. But we, we have talked about this before, and they seem hell set on provoking their own crisis. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Okay. So this, uh, this is an interesting chart, which um, you should take a look at and file away at the back of your mind. So this shows what will happen to U.S. inflation if month-on-month -month inflation prints are the red line, 0.3%, blue line, 0.2%, yellow line, 0.1%. And basically, what it's saying is that from now on, if month-on-month -month inflation cools down to 0.3% month-on-month, by the end of the year, CPI will be 3.7%. And we know, hopefully, that we're going to have a few negative CPI prints month on month during the course of the year. And so I found this quite reassuring. I suggest to me inflation actually should come down quite quickly once in the US, once rents start to feed through and US shelter, which lags terribly as we've covered many times, once that starts to fall. So um, this is the end of course survey again, which we spoke about previously, um, reveals that companies are no longer planning to increase wages, which is really interesting, and suggests that a uh, growth rate in wages um, is going to drop to zero over the, uh, a not particularly long period of time. Yeah. And you notice this survey was actually forecast the rise in wages very well. Yeah. Now they're saying, well, actually, we don't need to. We're not going to anymore. And um, according to the 
Taylor rule, which is um, the rule of uh, what the what the interest rate should be given the inflation rate. We should have interest rates of nine percent in the US. So there's a difference of about four percent. Yeah, uh, which is stonking. I don't know what happened to the US economy if they could put interest rates up to nine percent now, but it wouldn't be good. You would kill it, stone dead. So you know, I think the uh, Taylor rule is overly aggressive but you know i think the point of this is that the difference between the blue and the red lines here was enormous mm. and the reason yeah. we're in such a fix now is the fed do you remember all that stuff about inflation being transitory i do indeed you know, which we talked about for it. literally a year yes and, and and if we talk if we talk inflation down it will go down yeah, now this is frankly quite a frightening study from the ECB. And they estimate that a 1% rise in base rates only reduces inflation by around 15 basis points and takes about nine quarters to do so. So you're looking at the middle chart here and the dark blue line. So all these are different models. But their base model is the blue line, and they're saying a 1% rise in interest rates only impacts inflation by 0.15 basis point. Uh, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't pass the sniff test to me, Keith, because that means that if you want to reduce inflation by, let's say, 3%, you need to increase interest rates by 18%. Yeah. And wait nine quarters. Yeah, it just seems idiotic. But, you know... It's the ECB. Maybe we've misunderstood it, but it doesn't seem to make much sense. Hmm. As Richard points out, this seems absolutely ludicrous, but there you go. So World Container Index is it's plateaued, hasn't it, the last two months? It has a slightly down, slightly down trend, but it's, so it's dropped really dramatically from nearly 10,000 to 2,000 over the course of 12 months. But 10 months, the last couple of months, it's sort of plateaued but i did read yesterday that there's an awful lot of big container ships are coming coming out of dry dock just being just about to be completed and there's we going have to be a, a section on that coming up richard <laughs> sorry Keith. no no well <laughs> anticipated Keep doing this looks like every week there's something <laughs> <laughs> and uh jp morgan of shock to revise upwards their forecast for global growth um, and it's a sharp revision, isn't it? It's it basically is. gone from two point two percent to three point eight percent or so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And I don't, I don't like their revision upwards of core CPI much either. No, uh, exactly. I mean, they're, they're basically saying we're going to have growth and inflation, which is yeah. better than having um, a, um, de stagflation. But mm. we'd rather not have the inflation. Thank you very much. Uh, UK flash PMI versus inflation again, quite a, quite a good you know visual correlation um, between these numbers um, as a general rule. And uh, the composite PMI is dropping fast, so that suggests that the consumer price inflation is going to start dropping fast. I don't know if you listened to Radio Four this morning, but they were, they've done a little bit of research on the price of various staple foodstuffs in supermarkets and the price of pasta over the past two years. It's gone up by about 90%. Wow. I find listening to Radio 4 is bad for my mental health, Richard. Yeah, very it, much so. It raises your heart. heart it does. As well. It makes but me go rate. puce. <laughs> <laughs> so I've given up. Uh, not, not, a, not, a, not an unwise decision, I would say, in that case. Sadly. Yeah. Um, UK inflationary pressures remain elevated in the service sector, but the manufacturing sector is dropping quite fast. And US Trueflation, now what's this measure, Keith? Remind me. So Trueflation is a private company that uses real-time data. So, you know, we're, nowadays you have all this pricing information online, yeah? And so it uses all that data to try and calculate what real inflation is. And... 
I find it interesting that they've, um, you know, the trend. Now, bear in mind that there's probably a bias towards goods inflation here. But, you know, it's, in, it's still trending down and it's substantially lower than yeah. CPI. So year on year change in US M2 is negative and falling. I mean, we have this um, sort of thesis I, I particularly disagree with, which is that as the money supply drops, assuming the velocity of money stays constant, then the prices have to uh, stabilize and fall. Um, my only beef with it is that the velocity of money is actually a derivative of price and quantity of money. I completely agree, but you know, assuming, and let's face it, the monetarists like Milton Friedman, um, economics Nobel laureate, assumed that the velocity of money was constant, which we know it very much is not. So, yes. you know, all things being equal is a great economist argument. You know, in all things being equal, if the world was a perfectly spherical object, you know, then yes. inflation would <laughs> come down. Yes. <laughs> in a in a simple system. Yes. Um and um this chart shows apparently that there is a two year lag roughly between M2 and CPI. What I would say about this chart is if you eyeball it, I don't think the correlation is particularly good. Yeah, we don't mention that, Richard, you know. So draw your own conclusions about the correlation on that chart. <laughs> So um, all other things being equal, uh, the effect of the decline on M2 should start to in influence inflation in approximately five weeks' time. <laughs> and uh, so lower paid workers in the US are achieving positive real wage growth. And um, so there the, um, uh, the blue is the, is the first quartile and the black is the fourth quartile and um that is good news for, for lower paid workers yeah that's a good news for the u.s economy more disposable income so the german inflation does not look great does it you look at this chart and you think mm. you know, that's it yeah it's um it's like the uk inflation it's you know, it's not as high as the uk inflation it's not looking great yet yeah but i mean the I think the point about uh, German inflation and with a read through to UK inflation is a lot of you know, what CPI is going to look like depends on individual countries' energy support packages. And so the reason that German inflation rose in, in January is their support package ran out in December. And we've got a section on the UK coming up. And the fact that we have had an energy support package that has capped the energy prices for households means that going forward, UK inflation is not likely to come down as quickly as you might expect because it didn't have a huge rise up with energy prices. And now energy prices are coming down. It won't collapse. Yeah, of course, there's a little bit of a logical inconsistency in that in that calculation, not of what you said, but in that yeah. calculation that we don't include tax rates in, in the rate of inflation, but the capping of energy prices anywhere mm. is a subsidy that has to be funded through taxation ultimately. Yeah. So it's like shifting the uh, the cost as opposed to removing it. Anyway, that's a bit sort of into the weeds. <laughs> um, so Eurozone inflation being revised upwards, so it's not following just a straightforward downward path. US wage pressure does look like it's abating. US money supply is dropping fast year on year. Um, the big question, of course, is that we know monetary policy works with significant lag and things will start to slow. Inflation should start to slow. Have the Federal Reserve particularly done too much? And are they going to basically um, push the economy into, in the US economy, into an unnecessary recession? Well, I think so they're going to keep. I think they're going to keep on raising rates yeah. because the market's expecting them to, and the market had basically given them the green light to. So, yeah, 
at some stage they raise uh, too high for too long, killing the economy. And we know they're yeah. just enormous lags. And frankly, this is just inevitable. You know, last week we showed you the chart from the San Francisco Fed, which would broke down inflation into cyclical and non-cyclical segments, showing that higher monetary policy had as yet had no effect on the economy. So, you know, you're trying to drive the economy looking only in the rear view mirror with a 12 month lag. It's inevitable you're going to over tighten. Yeah. And also a lot of uh, interest payments are on fixed rates. And, and so the higher interest rates only really affects those when the businesses come to or individuals come to refinance. Yes. And that is. Well, that's a very good point, Richard. And that is why the UK inflation forecasts are much more aggressively negative than the US ones now, because you know, in the US, mortgages are 30 year fixed. In the UK, they're two to five year or variable. And throughout the course of this year, increasing number of households are going to be refinancing onto mortgage rates, which are 50 to 75 percent higher than they were a year, 18 months ago. So we've still got persistent, quite powerful inflationary pressures. Some of them actually do seem to be easing. So we're expecting to see some falls um, over the course of the next few months. Okay, on to recession watch. Thank you, Richard. Now, I thought this was a really important chart, actually, and I was going to have it as the one chart this week, but I found something even better. This chart shows the number of job losses in a recession by sector. And so it shows, and we've talked about this before, that the manufacturing sector leads the economy into recession and is the main sector which loses jobs. In fact, in the 1969 to 70 recession, all the job losses were in the manufacturing sector and the services sector actually grew. So in a normal recession, so excluding the pandemic, which is obviously exceptional, the service sector doesn't really lose many jobs. It's the manufacturing sector that sheds jobs and drives the economy into recession. And right now we're seeing a weakening in the manufacturing sector. We've got more on this later. And this is interesting. So the ISM survey of US industries, the number of industries reporting an increase in new orders hit zero in January. No industries reporting an increase in new orders. And obviously, it can't go any lower than that. And the last time this happened was in the depths of the great financial crisis. There's definitely some indicators showing there's significant slowdown in parts of the economy, aren't there? Yeah. The thing is, what I don't understand, Richard, is that seems to contradict you know the fact that all the other data is showing that conditions were improving in january so we're getting a lot of contradictory data here yeah you know now this is the conference board leading economic indicator and we this week we had the latest data for january and it showed that the leading indicator fell again but on a year-on-year -year basis, it was ticked up slightly because of the um, comparator. And it is still forecasting a recession. And if you're interested, these are the components. So the big one is new orders. New orders are very poor. And reminder, it is well below the point where you expect a recession. But the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index has turned actually strongly positive right. since late January. Something to watch. Um, Wells Fargo are forecasting a short recession in the second half of this year, then recovery in 2024. But on the Macro Voices podcast this week, we had someone who specialised in economic cycles, and he was saying that he's still very much expected a global recession. And he was saying that central banks 
are rapidly raising rates, even as leading indicators, as we have shown, warn of an imminent recession. And that combination is fatal. U.S. bankruptcies are on the rise. And surely that should produce some job losses, you would have thought. Yes, yeah, so. Mind you, the, uh, the job data is so heavily seasonally adjusted. Yes. It's it's tricky to di di uh, dissect the, the detail out of it. Yeah. Bankruptcies historically have been very closely correlated to GDP growth, as you would expect. So the bankruptcy number is forecasting falling GDP. Auto loan delinquencies are rising. And I think that's quite important because generally people will do anything to keep their car. And actually, those are quite high numbers approaching the numbers of the GFC. Mm. Credit managers indices, pause, take a look if you're interested, generally deteriorating, in some cases, really quite negative. And I would highlight accounts placed for collections. So companies are increasingly having trouble collecting the money they are owed. U.S. housing activity and construction activity is very poor. It bounced in January, but not by much. And we've shown you the uh, mortgage applications falling again. Mm. That bounce is unlikely to last. Real world economic data. U.S. railroad activity is not looking good. There's a strong seasonality to these figures, though. Import activity also not looking good. The bond market is very much predicting a recession in the US. And I thought this was interesting. This is architectural billings. And they are below 50, but they've bounced in January. And architectural billings lead construction activity in the commercial real estate sector by about nine months. So it's forecasting that commercial real estate construction activity will slow later this year. And home purchases are just awful, down 46% year on year. Layoffs are rising. As, so these are intended layoffs as reported by um, Challenger, Gray, and the various surveys, basically. This is the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Small Businesses in the US, and you'll see the balance reporting that earnings have deteriorated significantly in the last three months. What I found interesting about this chart is that they're always reporting the, that earnings are deteriorating, which can't be true. Um, profit margins are falling, and that should mean layoffs. So we've talked about this before. The in order to maintain earnings, you have to reduce staff and costs. Now, we have a section coming up on inventories. Now, in the manufacturing sector, manufacturing activity has been supported after the, over the last few years by the fact inventories were run down during the pandemic and when manufacturing activity essentially ceased. But now, inventory levels have returned to normal. And this chart shows in red that in action. So there's been a lot of manufacturing activity just to build back inventories. But now, inventory levels with manufacturers are now above average. So that process is complete for the manufacturers. It's also complete for wholesalers. So wholesalers have more inventory than they held previously on average. So and this is for, so that was for wholesalers durable goods. This is for non-durable goods. You see the clothing sector is holding an enormous amount of inventory. However, the retail sector has lower than average inventory, particularly motor vehicles we still haven't built rebuilt inventory in the motor vehicle sector okay so manufacturing overtime hours are falling which reflects 
declining manufacturing activity. Again, there's a little bounce in January. And ISM, new orders, which we know are very low, minus inventories, which I know are back to normal or above average, predict a recession, manufacturing recession in the US. And globally, the data just continues to deteriorate. The black line is hard data. Now, hard data is real economic data as measured by anyone. Soft data is survey data, consumer confidence, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see the hard data continues to fall. Soft data has had a bounce recently. Consumer loan delinquency rates are rising. They're still low, but they're rising again. But US fund managers increasingly believe it's going to be a soft landing. German house prices are falling, as you would expect, as the um, Eurozone interest rates rise. European bankruptcies are ripping higher. These are really quite stark numbers. And in the UK, we've had the ASDA income tracker for December. We're waiting January, and it shows that the average UK family had 10% less disposable income in December than a year ago. Mm. So as the um, higher mortgage rates feed through, I think this can only get worse this year. So in summary, despite the recent bounce in activity, all the leading indicators continue to forecast a recession later in 2023. I would highlight that new orders survey showing no industries in the US reporting net new orders. So over the last year, manufacturers have benefited from the need to rebuild inventories, and that is now passed. Bankruptcies are rising. Credit conditions are tightening. On to the market as a forecaster. Now, what this shows is credit spreads in the US in 1970 and 1974 going into a session. And what it shows is that essentially the market is terrible at forecasting the increase in credit spreads and bankruptcies. And the point is the market does not forecast the cycle very well. What it does is it extrapolates from recent conditions. And so don't expect the market's current market prices to be a good forecaster of what's going to happen in the economy. As conditions change, the market forecast can change very quickly. What they do is they extrapolate recent data forwards in time, expecting that recent data will continue. They don't forecast the cycle at all well. When the data changes, the market data can change very quickly. And quickly on to Tobin's Q ratio. Now, Tobin's Q ratio is a valuation method which basically divides the market value of a company, i.e. its um, number of shares in issue by the share price compared to the replacement value of the firm's assets. So the idea is that if the market value of the company is much higher than the replacement value of its assets, then shares are overvalued because you can simply just set up a new company for much che much cheaper price. And hence, you see charts like this, which show Tobin's Q ratio is very high, much higher than average, and at about 1.6 is that. So you can set up a new company much cheaper than you can buy one. And thank you very much to our Discord member, Draw It, for sending me this. But... I really caution about using um, Tobin's Q ratio because I think it was only relevant when the economy was mainly a manufacturing economy. As, as we move to services and 
information and relationships, I think it's lost all relevance, basically. You can, if you think of an advertising company, you know, it doesn't have any ma- many assets. You can go out and buy a load of computers and set up as a marketing company or advertising agency. But unless you have those relationships and the skill, then it's yeah. not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, It doesn't value goodwill, does it, Keith, at all? So a goodwill, as you say, in service sectors is, is, is a very um, important asset and takes a long time, can take a long time to develop. So it's, uh, it's only useful in the manufacturing sector, I think. Yeah. Good summary, Richard. Thank you. So we're going to do a little bit, a couple of charts on globalization. So offshoring in China is no longer economic. So we know that the uh, manufacturing cost, the labor cost in China um, was one of the fundamental reasons why China became the manufacturing hub of the world back in the 1990s. But you can see from this chart that um, manufacturing unit labor cost per hour in dollars in about 2012 or so exceeded all of its main cheap manufacturing competitors and has continued to soar basically. Uh, and so from a labor point of view, it is no longer competitive with again, against Vietnam, India, Taiwan, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So uh, that, and I think if you combine that with uh, the desire for US companies to reshore a lot of production, particularly of um, strategically important items, goods to America, um, means that um, there's going to be a big sh- structural shift in how the world manufactures goods. And this chart shows that whilst Asia has a very large potential workforce, and of course, as we've just seen, much cheaper than China, it doesn't have the infrastructure or links um, to make those industrial hubs, and that would take a lot of investment to achieve. So what's going to happen, I think, is... uh, I think what's going to happen is there will be significant structural shifts in the way goods are manufactured in the world. How exactly that plays out, I think it's a bit too difficult to, to try and estimate. Um, but obviously, it is bad for China, uh, good for domestic Western investment, uh, and probably bad for future goods inflation because the cost of manufacturing uh, will go up there's going to be significant investment elsewhere. And uh, direct investment into Asia is likely to rise, which is good for EMs. I think there's a the other trend that we've got is if where it's reshore, there's going to be an awful lot of automation going on. Yeah. Um, so, so that is another factor that will affect the, the cost, the, the capital investment and the cost of the goods <coughs> and the cost of the goods that are produced. And uh, with the sort of growth of machine learning and artificial intelligence, even though it's actually at pretty preliminary stages, a lot of, lot of structural shifts going on. Thank you, Richard. Okay, now, so over the last few weeks, we have had increasing discussion of not just a soft landing, but no landing at all. So essentially, the economy just continues to grow and the economic numbers have been doing uh have been surprisingly positive the idea for no long no landing means that the fed can bring inflation under control without slowing even slowing down the economy but the recent data from january are i think exaggerated because they were subject to record seasonal adjustments. So this is seasonal adjustments. And we've just had January, which is here. And these are the seasonal adjustments, which we know for the rest of the year. And so you see this January number is bigger than any number in history by a decent margin. But that will unwind over the next few months. So we'll go from... In the case of jobs, we know in January, the headline number was plus 517,000. But actually, the US economy lost two and a half million jobs. And there was an adjustment of plus three million. Well, 
over the coming months, we're going to have negative adjustments to the jobs numbers. And those are going to be big. So it's an open question as to how strong the January numbers actually were. And the rise in US retail sales was also subject to the large, third largest seasonal adjustment ever. And historically, we know that tightening lending standards equals a hard landing. You see here, when we have tightening, then you have a recession, which is the black bar. When banks ease lending standards, you can get a soft landing, but they're tightening lending standards, as shown on this chart, which shows percentage of domestic banks tightening lending standards for various different things. And you see that they are tightening hard now. So the thing is, no landing means that the jobs market in the US would remain tight and inflationary pressures remain strong. And we know that the Fed is committed to bringing inflation down. So ultimately, no landing is not an option. You either have to have a soft or a hard landing. And we know the January data in the US was affected by very mild weather. New York was the without snow for the first time since 1973. And so people went out and went to restaurants, etc., more than they would normally have done. And there was this enormous seasonal adjustment, which was a function of the fact we had Omicron last January in 2022. So I think it's too early to say what is going to happen to the US economy. But in particular, and I my earlier section on the market as a forecaster, the market it tends to extrapolate trends, recent data, and I think it is over extrapolated from questionable January data. OK, and now we have a long section on the UK economy, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Subject dear to our hearts. So we're all aware we've got this big strike issue going on. So the number of working days lost to strike action 22 was the highest since 1989. And a lot of it is public sector workers. I've said the vast majority of it is public sector workers. So, yeah, it's bad news, isn't it? And uh, UK peak, real pay growth, minus 3.6% in the three months of December. And um, I mean, we do have a, we have, I think we're all aware of, oh, we have a problem in the UK and the inflation is significantly too high. And the public sector, particularly, the relative rate, wage rates of maybe 10 years ago have fallen substantially. Mm. Um, and real, real wage rates, and uh, maybe by 20% or so, you know, often. And actually, we need people striking to redress that balance. And, you know, one, one has to have some sympathy with their point of view. People who, who became inactive, or a lot of people became inactive as a result of COVID, uh, we're now starting to see that some of them are returning to the workforce. And I, you know, I think there are probably economic pressures uh, at work here. If, you know, people's savings going less far because um, prices going up, the return on assets is actually not been very good. And um, forcing people back into the workplace, I suspect that is what is happening. That's also good for the economy. Mm -hmm. and, um, despite actually a lot of fears that disposable income was was um, under a great deal of pressure, retail sales did rise in January, and that's obviously good news for the economy. Um, and obviously, we also hope that it remains true for the rest of the year. I think um, it depends to what extent, Keith, that their people are using up their savings. Well, yeah, going, but the other thing is that we know over the course of this year that more and more households will be affected by rising mortgage rates. And, you know, monetary policy works with a lag. I just think, you know, it's yet to be felt properly. Yeah, thank you. I fear you may be right. So the Bank of England is expecting a shallow recession as opposed to a, uh, I've put a, long, a relatively long one. Actually, not relatively long, just a shallow one, um, as opposed to so, a 
actually saw it, Richard. I I think it's predicting a long one in that you know that is that's twelve quarters. Yeah, so, so if, look, yeah, if, if you look at the others, they're all none of them are less than us at that length. Yeah, true. That's true. Yeah. So um Bank of England is expecting a very shallow but not especially long recession. And uh the unemployment rate projection is um well, somewhere between two and a half percent and eight um, <laughs> percent. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the the Bank of England yeah. is doing a very good job of covering its back here. So they're hedging their bets a bit, aren't they, Keith? Yeah. So the way to interpret this chart is that each colour bar is the 30% probability range. So the dark purple, there's a 30% chance that it's going to be between what that 4.75 and 6%. And then the okay. next darkest bar can, can cover 60% of the range. And then light is, lighter purple, 90% of the range, and then 10% is outside that. But, you know, I mean, that they're covering absolutely every base, aren't they? I mean, it's, this is this is the sort of data that's precisely inaccurate, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and actually, not of any practical use, I would say. Well, I think um, you have to assume, you know assume their projection at the mid range, but they're saying it's highly uncertain. Interesting with this one, the, the range of inflation. They all come off at 90 degrees from the existing, uh, the real inflation rate line, don't they? Mm. <laughs> yep. You should apply for the job, Richard. I, I think I could do it quite well. I, I think City have also applied for it. So we saw this chart <laughs> earlier. Saw this chart earlier. So people are projecting that the inflation rate is going to drop in a nice steady straight line. That remains to be seen, doesn't it? So the Fed February monetary policy report from the Bank of England um, said, amongst many other things, headline inflation will continue to fall as pressures from energy and other external costs ease. But domestic and potentially more persistent inflationary pressures are likely to remain strong over the next few quarters, and it's uncertain how quickly to what extent they will abate, a aka tomatoes and peppers. In the central projection, the increasing degree, degree of economic slack alongside the falling external pressures Lead CPI inflation has declined to below the 2% target in the medium term, but the committee continues to judge that the risks to inflation are skewed significantly, significantly to the upside, mm. which basically is saying they might inflation rate might drop below 2%, but it might not. Mm. Um, and the only, the only thing that's really, I think, really um, concrete in that statement is the easing of um, energy pressures, price pressures. Yeah. Because you notice, what I really took away from this is that their forecast for falling inflation depends on a recession, increasing economic slack. And what's happened over the last few weeks is the market's come to believe that the UK could avoid a recession, which means inflation would not come down as much. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is that um, they've all set this, all central banks set this arbitrary 2% inflation target uh, based on the decision by the Central Bank of New Zealand quite a few years ago, um, which is an arbitrary decision that's on, on, its, on its own. And all the inflation targets uh, projections will come back towards the 2% line. Um, and it's a totally artificial situation. So I know that the Federal Reserve is now talking about whether they should amend their inflation target to something higher. Um, and... Um, that would be yeah. disastrous. You know, that's not yeah. thought through properly. Well, it makes their life easier, doesn't it, Keith? I think that's the that would that's the rationale for them considering it. They haven't done it yet. Yeah. No, they if let's think about what if they did that. In, inflation expectations would reset to three percent. Bond yields would all rise rapidly, given yeah. there is an enormous amount of debt in the world, that yeah. would mean that debtors, owners of existing debt, as long as they didn't have to refinance it, would be a lot better off. Creditors would get crushed. and But when debts came to be refinanced, they'd all refinance at higher rates, which would bankrupt yeah. a load of companies. Yeah. So we're not expecting inflation to fall much in quarter one. Well, it hasn't fallen much in quarter one so far. 
Um, and uh, the UK unemployment rate is still very low. Yeah. But I think so. If we go back to the earlier chart, you basically inflation falls at an accelerating rate across mm. the year. So the fact it hasn't fallen much in Q1 so far is perfectly consistent with projections. So if we look at UK inflation, then it showed an unexpected drop in January. In particular, there was a drop in service inflation. Now, you'll see that different components of UK inflation are rising at different rates. And we're just going to quickly go through some of those components so you can see where the inflationary pressures are. So this is accommodation services, which is very strong, 16% a year and not coming down. Rents are running at approaching 5%, again, not yet coming down. But you would expect that rising interest rates would lead to falling house prices, which would feed through to falling rents in the coming months. This is something I personally am interested in. Alcoholic beverages have shown a, actually a very sharp rise in January. Not good. Catering, coming down. Clothing, coming down education flat now this is interesting electricity gas and other fuels now we know that the gas price has absolutely collapsed and spot electricity prices have absolutely collapsed and are now well below their levels start of last year but because the uk has got this energy price guarantee it is unlikely that this component of CPI will actually come down very much because in the case of the gas price, you know, it is still way above where it was two years ago. And the caps have prevented gas prices rising as much as market prices. Financial services, hardly any inflation there, actually. Food strong inflation but we know the un food price index is falling sharply so hopefully you should see food price deflation over the coming months which should feed through into this component of cpi furnishings coming down goods in general still high but that should come down very quickly hopefully now health Unsurprisingly, as the health service is not doing well, people are turning to private health services and they are raising their prices because of excess demand. Hotels, this is an example of service inflation being persistent. Insurance, personal care still rising. Maintenance, transport collapsing, as you would expect with oil prices falling. These are oil prices now down where they were pre-invasion. Transport services also falling sharply. So that survey shows, actually, if you think about the services sectors, they're all showing strong inflation, which is yet to fall. So not actually very reassuring for the outlook for UK inflation. Reminder, the UK economy has not recovered to its pre-pandemic level. Yeah, so the UK economy is actually proving more resilient than we expected. Um, and uh, the Bank of England, as we saw, is expecting a shallow recession starting um, fairly soon. Uh, UK inflation falling, but inflationary pressures persisting in particularly the services sector. And we haven't yet seen the effects of the rapidly falling energy prices on the, on the UK inflation. So when wholesale energy prices fall, we would expect to, and they will, they almost certainly will do, we wish you should expect to see inflation start to fall quite quickly as well, which obviously is good news to the UK economy. So a little bit on container ships. Container ships ordered during the pandemic supply chain crunch that we had, well, there were an awful lot of them. And uh, these, uh, the size of a container ship is 
is measured in how many 20 foot equivalent units it can carry. So we have the ultra large ones can carry more than 20,000 containers, uh, which is a lot, isn't it? And then we have the Neo Panamax, 12 to 16,000, the handy Neo Panamax, handy size container ship. So what we can see is that an awful lot of container ships are due for delivery during uh, the course of this year. And we saw earlier that the um, uh, shipping price has, has plummeted down from uh, nearly 10,000 to 2,000. And what this will do to shipping prices only knows, goodness only knows, or indeed what it will do to the shipping companies when they find that they can't make any money on their new ships. So there's going to be a bit of a crunch in container shipping. Uh, there's, a, there's an expectation that 10% of these orders will be cancelled, presumably at some significant cost, and 25% will be delayed. But I would also say once, once ships start to be built, it's probably quite difficult to cancel it without incurring a great deal of costs. Yeah. You see, these red bars, you know, expect these are on order for delivery 2023. I mean, there's a lot of container ships down the, coming down the pipe. Isn't that just? It's going to put a lot of smaller, older container ships out of business, presumably. Yeah. Make it like economic to, uh, to operate. So, and here's the graph of container shipping rates. And presumably, those, the, the little plateau that we've got at the bottom there is going to start heading off downwards again. Yeah. Once the ships hit the, uh, hit the seas. So, this is a classic example. Yes. Beware the capital cycle. Uh, high prices during the pandemic led to overinvestment in new supply. Low prices are likely to be the norm. Until this glut that we're going to see has been resolved through either retirement of older ships or bankruptcy of shipping companies and scrapping of ships. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then time to invest in shipping companies will be when they've all gone, most of them gone bankrupt and they've retired all their old ships. Yep. And old new companies. orders are totally collapsed. Yeah, exactly. Not yet. Not yet. Thank you, Richard. On to other charts. An amazing, <laughs> this is an amazing chart. This shows that Europe, European industry managed to consume 25% less gas in 2022 while maintaining production. And so this is why the Eurozone economy has proved more resilient. Yeah. Human ingenuity should never be underestimated. It is an amazing chart, isn't it? Because we all thought it was going to devastate European manufacturing. Yep. And we were wrong. Absolutely. People adapted. Now, we report every week a load of data, <laughs> which is based on surveys. For example, the JOLTS job report in the US. But this chart shows that the surveys are becoming increasingly unreliable because then companies are just simply not responding to them. If you look at the JOLTS job report, then it used to have a reply rate of about 70% 10 years ago. It's now fallen to about 30%. So how reliable is the official government data that we report to you in good faith? This is Chinese property sales, latest figures for January. That ain't looking good. It's not picking up. And we look at China. China is the blue line here. And the we have been expecting China to get old before it gets rich. Well, there you go. By mid-century, China will have a higher dependency ratio than Japan. And we live in an Asian century. This is amazing. So by 2025... Asia will consume half the world's electricity. Just compare that with 2000. Its share of world electricity consumption essentially doubled in 25 years. And on to good news. Now, this is really interesting. So did you know that there is hydrogen trapped in the earth? And... I wouldn't have thought that was possible. But it's hydrogen. Yeah, it's very, very volatile. Yeah, very yeah. active. But actually, hydrogen occurs naturally in the earth and is being exploited in Mali, amongst other places, 
So what happens is that hydrogen is produced in the Earth when water reacts at high temperature and pressure with iron minerals. And the mineral on the left is called olivine, and it reacts with water, basically taking out the oxygen to produce serpentine and releasing hydrogen. Now, it was thought that hydrogen trapped in the earth was quite rare, but actually they've since come to realize that it's actually not that rare. It's just that we've been drilling in the wrong places. The only time you find it is when you drill down to the earth and you tend to drill down into the earth where there's oil and gas expected. And actually hydrogen is found in other places. It's found in regions which are tectonically stable, not regions which where the plates are moving, which is where you tend to find oil and gas deposits. Hence, that, is, uh, that, is, that is very good news, Keith. Can I just comment? It's not actually good news for rising sea levels because when you burn hydrogen, you get water. We'd have to burn a lot of it, mate. <laughs> anyway, right, it's also not good for global oxygen levels, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, there is this company in Spain called Helios Aragon aiming to produce green geological hydrogen, he says. So, anyway, good news. So, a new source yeah. of energy. So moving on to the equity, uh, weekly equity checklist. The FTSE um, down a little bit on the week, half a percent. Stocks Europe was up um, nearly 1%. Actually, stocks is up nearly 10% on the year to date. The S&P 500 is down nearly 2%. And the NASDAQ also down 2%, although up in nearly 11% year to date. Hang Seng pretty much neutral on the year. And the topics uh, not very much changed. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, a little bit of a increase this week, but um, nothing up, nothing yet along the lines of the forty-four percent increase year to date. The pound up a bit against the dollar, but unchanged for the year. The euro down a bit against the dollar, but almost unchanged for the year. And the dollar index up very slightly, but not really very much changed for the year. And the VIX up a little bit but um, not much changed on the year. So not a huge amount of movement in the markets, except I would say for the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, which clearly quite important elements. <laughs> so there's the uh, Hang Seng. Yeah, some of the optimism about China fading. The real S&P since 1913, and the latest real drawdowns is adjusted for inflation. What we can see is that after we've had a bubble, uh, there tends to be a long period of a real price underperformance for equities. So you can say we have had a bubble. Um, I don't think there's much doubt about that. And then if you extrapolate the below the, the shade areas to here, you have, that we might be looking for a um, 10 or 15 year period before the peak in the S&P 500 is regained, if history is a guide. Um, but also fairly significant drawdown in addition to what we're, that we're seeing now in real terms. Absolutely. So are we still in a secular bear market? So are we still in a secular bull market or have we entered a bear market? Looking at this chart, a bit too early to tell. And in fact, the problem with these things is that you can really only tell retrospectively. Yeah, completely agree. That's a chart that shows the uh, relationship between the forward earnings per share growth on the S&P 500 and the actual index in blue. And you can see that uh, the forward uh, earnings per share growth has fallen a lot more than the S&P 500 index has. And that's also a time of rising interest rates. Yeah. Suggesting the S&P 500 has further to fall. But US, US retail investors are, are enthusiastically buying the rally. Bulk shipping rates have fallen 28%. But the share prices of, of shipping companies are up by 15 How does that work? Well, it doesn't really, does it? 
But I think shipping companies did very well coming out of the pandemic, didn't they, or in the pandemic? So maybe people are hoping for a repeat. Yeah. And uh, Bitcoin has not achieved mass adoption, but it's working on it, Keith. <laughs> Have, have you uh, used your Bitcoin recently, Richard? You've sold them all, haven't you? So we've had some big move amongst tech stocks stocks um, over the past month. So NVIDIA has gone up um, dramatically, and several others have increased significantly as you look look through there. Um, so um, this, and we saw the Nasdaq's up ten percent on the mm. year. Uh, so that has received a lot of uh, investment interest recently. And NVIDIA, or NVIDIA, how you pronounce it, is on a PE ratio of 88.4. And spoiler alert, although I said I was buying NVIDIA for the long term, I sold it last week. <laughs> well, well done. Good so trip. I saw this too, and I thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. For, so equity risk premium is at a very low level, although it's been since the great financial crisis. So what could go wrong? And in recent weeks, the S&P 500 has outperformed net. What does that mean, Keith? Well, we did a whole section on this. Um, in fact, I cut out that section from week 96 and published it as a short podcast this week. So if you remember, financial liquidity equals the Fed balance sheet minus the TGA account minus the reverse repo facility. And there was an astonishing correlation between the two and the, the S&P 500 and net liquidity. And you see that in recent weeks, the S&P 500 has outperformed net liquidity. If the correlation holds, the S&P 500 should come back down to earth. It sure should, shouldn't it? Quite substantially, actually, as well. Yeah, but on the flip side, I just, you know, it's one of those correlations you think, that just can't make sense because, you know, earnings matter, sentiment yeah. matters, the economic outlook matters. It's not just yeah. net liquidity. Yes. And on to commodities and energy commodities. So oil prices had an indifferent week down slightly and are down around uh, 5% on the year for WTI, 3.5% for Brent. European natural gas prices appear to have found a bottom. So Dutch natural gas futures were up 3.6% on the week, down 30% on the year. UK natural gas futures were essentially flat, down 30% on the year. US natural gas futures, having had a terrible start to the year, bounced by 7% and down 44% on the year. Coal kept on falling, down 46% on the year. Uranium was flat. Now, numbers specific to the oil market, we continue to see builds in the US. US oil inventories rose by a further 3.3 million barrels this week. US oil production remained stable at its highs, and the Baker Hughes rig count ticked down by two. This is Brent. Is that a bottom? Seems to be going nowhere. Oil tanker shipping rates have risen sharply this year. Now, we showed you earlier the section on container ship shipping. Oil tankers are a completely different market. And there's been a big increase in demand for oil tankers because of Russian oil shipments now largely going by sea. Yeah. Now, we've talked previously <laughs> about how China is reopening and the Light blue line here is Chinese international flights, which are increasing rapidly, but jet fuel prices still falling. So uh, if this is an analogy for Chinese reopening and its effect on the world, it's not having the effect you might hope. European natural gas futures, are they finding a bottom? And this is... The long-term LNG contracts by location, you see that over the coming years, China is going to dominate, taking 80% of new supply. UK natural gas futures, again, is that a bottom? US natural gas futures, mm, not great. 
Okay, so why have US natural gas futures fallen so much? And I'm going to read this out. This is from John Kemp at Reuters. The US gas market appears to be running a persistent surplus since early September 2022. Working inventories in underground storage were plus 77 billion cubic feet, or 4%, above the 10-year seasonal average. The storage surplus marks a significant turnaround from a deficit of minus 427 billion cubic feet as of September the 9th. So inventories are building rapidly in the US. And this is the long term real natural gas price in the US. And you can see it's pretty much at its all time low. And that is despite natural gas stocks actually only being around their seasonal average, not really that much above it. But the point is, they've been building quickly. And the market fears that actually they're going to fill up all this storage in the summer. And high inventories means low prices. Pause, take a look. This is coal, still falling. Uranium, pause in its recent rise. Richard, commodities. So we had some quite big movements during the week on commodity prices. So aluminium, um, that's almost unchanged for the year, but cobalt now down 34% for the year. A very dramatic drop there. The copper is down 1%, but up 6% on the year. Chromium pretty much unchanged on the year. Yeah. And iron ore up, uh, up on the week and up 12% on the year. Lithium carbonate is down nearly 25% year to date. And a big move uh, this week. Neodymium oxide uh, down 4% on the week, 4% on the year. Nickel, uh, quiet week, but down 12% on the year. Tin uh, up 8% on the year, not much during the week. And ferrovanadium up 2.6% uh, in the week, 8% for the year. And zinc pretty much unchanged on the year. Aluminium. I should say that this week, all the charts are long-term charts, 25 years. There's cobalt, very volatile. Yeah, that spike completely unwinding. And copper, still a long-term upwards trend. Chromium. And iron ore. And uh, there's a bit of commentary at the top, which you might want to read um, giving some in, an indication as to why the iron ore price is up, commenting on low inventories in Chinese steel mills. So have a read of that. And also supply chain problems in Brazil and Australia. So yeah. it's a combination of the two. And lithium carbonate. So the, um, as you said, the price of uh, lithium carbonate in China tumbled uh, in late February on uh, again read the box but worldwide recession fears um household poor household confidence and um the end of chinese stimulus for battery manufacturers mm. so um again i mean lithium had a very very powerful run up last year and um it has pulled back a bit but not um to a huge extent so uh, but I think, um, generally speaking, demand is going to outweigh uh, supply for quite a long time to come. Well, what this shows, Richard, is that how much demand depends on subsidies. Because, uh, you know, unless you subsidize the price of electric vehicles, they remain much more expensive than internal combustion engines. And yeah. the Chinese have just cut these subsidies, you know, end result, yeah. big drop in demand for electric yeah. vehicles. Yeah, but I, I suspect there'll be some other... Um, uh, some other incentive or disincentive to buy a, an internal combustion engine vehicle versus an uh, electric vehicle that, that maybe governments will put, introduce to remove the cost of the subsidy but, but put the onus back on the consumer. So, But, it, I mean, the, the fact remains that while it's volatile at the moment, the, um, the, if, if we're going to electrify the, vehicle, the world's vehicle fleet by 2050, 2030, or you know, pick a year, there, there is a huge amount of lithium required. Yeah, but I mean, I, I again, and this is your point, that I question the, um, 
you know, the point of that target when China's, you know, most of its electricity comes from coal. So what, you're yeah. burning loads of coal so you can have an electric vehicle. You know? Yeah, it's uh, it's non-joined up heat, isn't it? Mm. So there's neodymium. Actually, sort of dropped back down to its trend line. Uh, nickel. It's a lot of bother in nickel market, isn't there? Because mm. there's a, a lot of nickel has been stolen by someone. Oh, yes. Yeah, we talked about it last week. Yeah. Uh, tin. Ferrovanadium. Not really done anything terribly exciting for two years. And zinc. This is on a you know, fairly steady upward trend. Mm. Up threefold since the mid 2000s. And then precious metals. So gold pretty much unchanged for the week and the year. Silver, a little bit down on a week. Quite a big change on the year, 11.5%. Um, platinum down 12% on the year, a bit up on the week. Rhodium down 7%, bit down on the week, and palladium down 20%. So we believe this is because of the reduced demand for fuel for um, internal combustion engine catalytic converters for the last three there's gold now near the top of its uh, current range silver platinum rhodium i thought this is an interesting chart actually when you look at it over the last 25 years you know essentially you've had this enormous spike caused yeah. by the eu emission standards and yeah. if we're moving to electric vehicles and you know this week was it bentley was saying they were retiring yeah. their v12 a fantastic v12 yes i know it's a shame isn't it they're, they're, they're absolute works of art those engines. yeah yeah i'm deeply skeptical about you know how and palladium which is sort of plummeting <laughs> yeah but in both cases, you know, they could have a lot further to fall. They could indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Richard. And on to rates. And rates continued to rise in the UK. The UK um, two year rose by six basis points, the uh, 50 year by a bit. In Europe, we also had raising, rising yields. Okay. So. This is market expectations for the Fed's funds rate, as we showed you a bit earlier, and now expected to peak in July at about 5.25%. So that's another 75 basis points of rises. And inflation expectations have really shot higher over the course of the last month. The two-year is now expected at 3%. So the market now believes inflation is not under control. And mm. in the EU, five-year five forwards are rising again and approaching their highs. So despite the fact inflation is now coming down everywhere, people think it's not going to come down very quickly. Okay, so what has really caught me out and my portfolio is that the UK yield curve has flattened. And so this is the yields from one year to 50 year in the UK. And you'll see that the 20 year yield equals the one year yield. And so the market now does not believe the UK is going to get inflation under control. The other way of looking at this is that it believes over the course of the next 30 years that UK interest rates will average 4%. It's just ludicrous. You know, the market, I think the market has completely lost the plot here. And there are technical factors which are driving the, the yields up. And it has lost sight of the absolute yields that are now available in the UK. Because if we look at the US, it's very clear. The US yields are expected to peak in six to one year, six months to one year's time, and then they're going to come down. So it believes. But again, it's saying that long term, 4% going forward is just not compatible with the 2% uh, inflation target. Now, the UK has lots of index linked guilt issuance. And when inflation is 12%, that means you need to pay 12% 
on those index-linked gilts. Interest payments have jumped as a percentage of GDP. Now, that is likely an accounting um, function because those you won't be paying 12% cash, but your liability will have increased by 12%. And that gives the UK the highest interest bill as proportion of government revenue of anywhere in the developed world. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so this is the UK 10 year. It's been rising steadily since the jobs report. Is it peaking? Fingers crossed. 30 year, that is a new high, actually, outside of the extraordinary shenanigans around the trust mini budget. UK t US 10 year, has that found a near term peak? Too early to tell. German 10 year, similar. Italian 10 year. The spread between Italian and German tenure is not <clears throat> rising. So the market is not concerned about a Eurozone crisis. And this is Greece. Any change to your views, Richard? No, well, I'm, I was um, I'm, last week I was a bit iffy about bonds and I'm still iffy about bonds, basically. Uh, I think no, no, no. Apart from that, no. How about you, Keith? No, no change. I played the cycle. Sorry, you still think bonds are a buy? Actually, I do, and we'll go th when I go onto my personal portfolio. We'll talk about it. So, concluding comments. Well, February's PMIs all showed a bounce, and the markets have extrapolated that to the expectation there'll be no recession in 2023. Equities have bounced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as we've shown you, leading indicators are all continuing to forecast recession in H2 2023. US housing market activity continues to weaken to the lowest levels seen in some cases ever, or at least since the great financial crisis. Global credit conditions are tightening, layoff announcements are rising, bankruptcies are rising. So I absolutely stick with my forecast that we're going to have a recession in the second half of the year. Richard, what have you been up to this this week? So, um, my portfolio is uh, is just slowly declining at the moment. So I'm now up six point one percent for the year, and uh, the FTSE All Share is up six point two percent for the year. So I'm now my relative performance is now uh, minus point one percent for the year. My sale, I made a something like a seventeen percent gain on Nvidia. Very good. And, uh, I, I too, you know, I too read the uh, eighty-eight price earnings ratio article. I oh, just, it's just, you know, this is too rich. So I thought that um, I just get out. And this is the Nvidia price chart where you can see that since the beginning of the year, it's actually gone up by um, sixty percent or so. Sadly, I didn't buy it here. I just bought it somewhere <laughs> around here. I think, where it was like not that long ago, was it? Yeah, so that's uh, but that's my only activity. Apart from that, I'm sitting on my hands. There's been a bit of a drawdown in uh, uh, silver, particularly in, since the start of the year, and uh, gold hasn't moved since the start of the year. There's been a bit of a drawdown in the uh, gold mining equities. Some of the other mining equities I've got um, stable or, or doing better. So as a generality, I'm sort of pretty much stuck in the sand at the moment. I think, uh, but I'm just just sitting here waiting. How about you, Keith? How have you done? Well, I had another poor week, taking me down one and a half percent on the year, which is very disappointing. And frankly, I was feeling really quite depressed about it earlier in the year, earlier in the week. But I've kind of got over myself. That means I am massively underperforming Richard and the all share. Um, now let's talk about uh, my last remaining gold mining company, Goldplatt. Now the shares had been suspended while we awaited the publication of the results. Now, the company was saying that the annual accounts were delayed because the auditors basically couldn't cope. So they're suffering from um, the pandemic disruption and unable to basically get the work done in time. And, you know, so the shares were suspended for six weeks, but they've now been published and the results were as expected. So, you know, that seems to actually have been the explanation but on publication of the results the share price dropped very sharply because although the annual 
results for last year were good. The latest quarterly numbers were disappointing because gold plat main operations were in South Africa and it is suffering from power disruptions due to the South African ESCOM um, doing uh, not being able to supply the country with electricity. So there are these uh, planned outages, these load shedding, load shedding currently at emergency grade six, and it's expected to get worse to grade eight later in the summer. Essentially, wow. South Africa is failing as a country and Gold Platt do not have <clears throat> any alternative electricity supplies and they're expecting electricity disruption to continue to disrupt operations going forward there are lots of other good things to like about gold plat frankly but right now if electricity disruptions get worse then expect disruptions to earnings etc and functions going forward now the Brokers are forecasting that electricity supply in South Africa improves next year. Well, they've been saying that for a while, and I'm not optimistic. Mm. Okay, on to my main bet, and this is the UK 2071 gilt. It's hitting new lows, very bad for me. A long way down from its, when I bought it, about 66 expecting then it was on a rising upward trend well it's absolutely collapsed and i've got stuffed this is u.s treasury etf 20 year plus had a little bounce but still very poor now let's talk about index link gilts and this is one of my biggest holdings i bought it back here expecting it to then continue rising and it's drifted off now i was talking on the discord earlier about you know what would happen if index link gilt prices fell further and i am 55 i reckon that i've got what 15 25 years left which to enjoy you know um, a decent lifestyle and so the thing is at these prices so this is the 2040 index link gilt its current price is 101.4 it yields 0.625 percent so over the remaining 17 years of this gilt, this index in gilt, you will get inflation tax free plus 0.625% in interest. So that is pretty unbeat. That's really difficult to beat as an investor. If you're a high rate taxpayer, if you think about equities, you're going to pay a high rate taxpayer like 47% on the dividends you pay in the higher rate tax threshold plus you're going to if you get buy equities 20 percent on any capital gain every time you trade in and out of equities or you can just buy the index in guilt and get 0.625 percent plus cpi and until 2030 you actually get rpi an RPI, as we covered last week, generally outperforms CPI by 0.8%. So therefore, for until 2030, you're getting a real return of plus 1.425%, 0.8% of that tax-free. So if this keeps on falling, frankly... I'm just going to stick all my money in indexing guilt and forget about it. Go to the beach, you know. Oh, good for you, Keith. It's um, it's an interest. That's an interesting discussion. During the week, I had a long conversation with fellow podcaster Rogue Trader, and we were going through each other's portfolio, and it made me realise that I have very good sell discipline, but I have very poor buy discipline and what has got me into trouble this trade is that i have not set rules under for myself under which i would buy index link gilts or the gilts trade i did it on instinct and once again i've been far too early now going forwards 
I need to impose on myself better by discipline. And so going forwards, I fully intend to increase the size of my bet on UK gilts, but thinking about it and seeing the charts we showed you this week on market expectations for future interest rates, the rule is by discipline, I'm not going to add to it until UK interest rates have peaked. That's the rule. And then I'll add it hard. So you've seen over previous weeks that I've been tinkering, adding to it and losing money. That's not going to happen anymore. I've now got a rule and I'm going to impose on myself some buy discipline. Well, well done, Keith. That sounds like a very good idea. And now we have an update from Stuart Owen on how his portfolio is doing in these very volatile markets. Stuart. Well, Keith, you've had, to, you've had to twist my arm to get these statistics out of me because <laughs> it ain't looking too great. Um, so year to date, I'm up 1.6% uh, as against the all share, 6.7%. So um, I had rather hoped that I'd be you know, doing rather better, things I've you know, been um, more fully invested than, than you and Richard, who are playing a bit more cyclical game, but it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, right, so how have I been getting on? Um, well, as ever, um, I'm going to repeat what I always say, uh, drip, drip, drip of income. Um, the yield on my portfolio is about 4.5%, so... In any particular month or quarter, there's not too much, but um, my whole point is to harvest that income, reinvest it and, and compound up. Um, th there was one particular extra source of income uh, over the past couple of months, uh, which refers back to the presentation I did on REITs, which is this issue of property income uh, distributions having uh, tax withheld but within a SIP or an ISA, you can reclaim that tax, um, which can be a little bit of admin burden. It wasn't, wasn't too bad. It was just slow. But anyhow, that, that kicked in um, uh, in January. So that, that was a, a little bump. So just a bit of you know, admin um, helping the, the compounding along. So, uh, yeah, as we just observed, uh, the all share up 6.7%. And um, we've seen, uh, for instance, the NASDAQ doing um, even better. So in, there have been very strong markets, but they have typically been led by the more speculative elements. Um, and obviously, that's not really where I fish. So uh, my infrastructure and green energy investments, for instance, have you know, been totally flat, just kicked off their dividends and have done very little. And um, green energy and infrastructure for me are 10% and 8% respectively of, of my portfolio. Uh, REITs, which is the biggest proportion, that's uh, 27%. They've sort of mirrored gilts, really. Um, when gilts have rallied, then the REITs have rallied and, and conversely. So just at the moment, they're, they're not particularly helping. Um, the asset-backed trusts that uh, I'm invested in, they're doing okay. Um, uh, oil infrastructure, that's the US pipelines in particular, and property lending. So it's been a sort of meh couple of months, and it, it's fine. It's uh, doing its job of kicking in um, regular income, but uh, is obviously lagging much more enthusiastic markets. Now, uh, when Keith asked me to give this little update, I, I went through and had a look at uh, what's going on in uh, each of those stocks. And there, there was one that I thought I'd highlight to people because I think it, it's a bit interesting if you're of my, my frame of mind, probably not one for you, Keith. But um, um, on the next slide, uh, I'm just uh, illustrating the special situation in the Starwood European Real Estate Finance Trust. And the chart here shows in the dark blue line, the total share price return from the investment, and the lighter uh, blue line shows the NAV total return um, mm. from the investment trust, which you can see has been pretty steady, but the share price total return has lagged the NAV return. Now, this is an investment trust which um, does property-backed lending. It's about a 400 million size, so reasonable, not, not huge, but not tiny. Now, the loans have a loan-to-value average of 58%, i.e., you know, the 
uh, the assets could fall by 40% on average, and you'd still have enough to cover the value of the loan. And 80% of the loans that the trust makes are at floating rates, so they're going to be ticking up uh, as interest rates rise. So that, that's my sort of typical sort of Stuart sort of investment, and it pays a 5.5% covered dividend on the 90p share price, so you're getting a running yield of 6.1%. Of so, so far, that, that's all very standard, very my sort of thing. <clears throat> but the interesting thing here is that the trust has voluntarily decided to wind itself up. And that gap in the chart between the uh, NAV total return and the share price total return, you, you could expect to, um, to close up. So if you believe the uh, NAV calculation, then that's an NAV of 105p, so 16% ahead of the current share price. So to my mind, you're going to get a 6.1% running yield, plus the possibility of, you know, even if you don't get all of that 16% um, closure between the NAV and the share price, you, you could hope, I think, to get a, a reasonable proportion of it, minus perhaps some winding up costs, etc. So the key issue for this fund is, you know, well, how long are the loans? I mean, how long is a wind up going to take? And on average, the, the loans have got about 1.7 years to maturity. So it, the, the wind-up might not take too long. Um, Starwood runs a very large property finance business. They might be able to uh, sell the loans to another fund within their, their stable for the, for the longest um, maturity loans. So to me, this looks like an interesting uh, opportunity. It's uh, asset-backed and the gap between the apparent value and the share price has got a, a genuine catalyst to, to close up. That looks actually very interesting because it's not actually property-backed, it's loan-backed. And the loans have got a loan-to-value 58%, so you're well covered. So even if the uh, real estate values fall, then the loans should be repayable and actually there is therefore much less uncertainty about the nav because the nav is the value of the loans rather than the value of the property which is you know open to um, falls in the market so that looks really good actually so when when would they pay out would they pay out the capital as it's received over the next you know three years let's say or are they going to return it all in one lump to be decided, that's the thing. Um, you'll see in, in the chart, there's a bit of an uptick um, this year in the share price. And that was the result of the initial statement where the, the fund said, look, um, there isn't enough of a market for us anymore. We're going to wind up. But the, the actual details of it are to be determined. So there, there's, there's some uncertainty about that. But there is at least a, a genuine catalyst to, to wind it up. Mm, interesting great okay thank you Stuart and this week has been a very long episode because there will be no episode next week as I'm going to be in Tokyo to run the marathon slowly good luck good luck with that Keith in the meantime thank you very much for watching through to the end please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and it's goodbye from Richard Wheater and it's goodbye from Keith Jordan goodbye goodbye Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. 
nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.